ready for takeoff. Oh my goodness. You can't, uh, I get at least like six seconds back on this clock. That, that's not fair. They started the clock before they switched the slides up here. I, and I got to use all of these minutes. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> oh, all right. Um, did anybody else, like, did anybody else have a hard time with these elevator buttons? <laughs> Like when I got to the, when I got to the hotel, I just I went to the elevator. I'm like, I don't understand where the buttons are, but one of the one of the doors is open. I'll just go in and use that. So I did that, and then and then I had to leave and meet meet people. And I go to the elevator, and I'm like, uh, I'm not I'm not I don't know how to use these. It took forever for me to figure out that these buttons are actually like I thought this was the emergency sign, which it is, <laughs> but I thought the buttons were like part of it. Um, anyway. <laughs> I don't know why I'm going on about this. I just I don't have time. Uh, so this this talk is titled uh, "Don't At Me: uh, Faster Instance Variables with Object Shapes." Oh, hold on a sec. Let me. I gotta shut off the notifications here. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm very excited to be in Houston. I've never been to Houston before, so I'm really, I'm really happy to be here. The food is great. This is a lot of fun. Um, my name is Aaron Patterson. I usually put about like 15 minutes worth of stand-up at the beginning of my presentations, but I just don't have time for that here, so I cut all of those. I'm really sorry. Um, I'm part of the Ruby core team. I'm also on the Rails core team. Uh, my, I go by Tenderlove everywhere online, so you can find me. You can find me on all of the social media with, with that handle, uh, except for on LinkedIn. I use my more professional name there, which is also Tenderlove. Uh, I work for a mom and pop e-commerce website <laughs> called Shopify. Uh, I'm on the Ruby infrastructure team at Shopify. Our team is working on like different projects to improve the performance of Ruby, as well as the quality of life of developers uh, working, working for Shopify and also in the Ruby community at large. Uh, I would say like our team's customers are essentially the development teams at Shopify, so we're making Ruby and Rails better so that uh, they can get their jobs done more quickly and with fewer resources. Uh, we're working on different projects like uh, YJIT, GC improvements, um, like the variable width allocation project, and other infrastructure improvements as well. So I'm here today to talk to you about instance variables and how, how they work. Um, I was going to talk, like, call this talk instance variables TMI because I am going to tell you way too much information about instance, instance variables. But instead of just being like a pure fact-based mission here, what I want to do is I want to derive the way that instance variables work so that hopefully um, we're, we're going to implement them together and hopefully you'll be able to come away with a deeper understanding of how, how they work and why we make different decisions with regards to um, performance and optimization. So I'm also going to be talking about object shapes, which is a technique that we use for speeding up access of instance variables as well as other things. This project has been ongoing at work. My team's been working on it, and it's going to be shipping along with the Ruby 3.2 release. And I'm also going to be talking about how all of these things work together with uh, YJIT in order to make uh, instance variable access uh, extremely fast. And I'm going to do all of this in 30 minutes. <laughs> uh, first off, I want to say thanks to everyone on the uh, Ruby infrastructure team, the YJIT team. Especially, uh, I've been working very closely with Gemma on this project. And I also want to thank Maxime for her guidance on the project as well. And I also want to give a shout out to John Hawthorne at GitHub. He's been helping, he's been helping on this project as well. So there's been a lot of people working on this together. Uh, so let's talk about how IVARs work. Uh, this is a joke for all of the people from Seattle, yes. Um, very local joke. All right. So just a kind of a note here, I'm going to refer to them as instance variables, also IVARs, and also IVs. Those all mean the same thing. I just need to shorten it sometimes because I only have 26 minutes left. So 
let's talk about implementing instance variables. Let's say we have a very simple class like this with a couple instance variables on it. If we were implementing a language, like how might we, how might we store this data? Like how, how would we store it? I think a really, a really simple way to accomplish this task would be to just store your instance variables in a hash table on the instance. So for example, we'd have our instance of hello here, and we'd say, all right, we got a hash table associated with the instance of hello. The key to the hash table is gonna be the name of the instance variable, and the value, the value in the hash table will be the, the value of the instance variable. Uh, and we can imagine writing this, writing this code is pretty easy. We could imagine implementing it something like this, where we just have that hash table associated with all of our instances. When you write something, it writes to the hash table. When you read something, it reads from the hash table, et cetera. Like all of these seems pretty easy to implement if we understand how hash tables work. And in fact, this is, this is how instance variables were implemented in Ruby 1.8 and earlier. That's how they, how they worked. Uh, Ruby 1.8 and earlier was implemented via a tree walking interpreter. And the way the tree walking interpreter works is we would take, we would take um, your code and turn it into a tree, and then we would walk each node in the tree and evaluate those nodes in the tree. So here we have a very simple example. This tree is representing the code inside of the method foo. So we have uh, foo plus bar. And the way it would work is we would say, okay, we're gonna, we wanna evaluate that method or that plus node there, but we can't evaluate it yet because we have to evaluate its children. So we evaluate foo. Uh, foo does a hash lookup to get that value one out, and then bar also does a hash lookup to get the value two out, and then we return those values back up the tree. They get returned up. Plus is able to execute, add those two together, and then return to the caller. Now, 1.9 came along, Ruby 1.9 came along, and introduced a virtual machine and what the virtual machine did is it would compile all of your code into uh, bytecode and execute, execute that bytecode. I'm not gonna go into the compilation process because not much time, uh, but let's walk through how the virtual machine might execute this. So the virtual machine first it's gonna take, or the compiler is gonna take that foo method and convert it into bytecode, so we'll have some bytecode like this. And it's gonna walk through each of those instructions one at a time and just execute them. And as it's executing those instructions, it's gonna manipulate a stack. So we also have a stack right here. So you imagine, all right, we're just gonna loop through each of these, execute them, and then manipulate the stack. The first thing we'll do is we'll say, hey, get Ivar here, we'll push one onto the stack. Uh, get Ivar for bar, we'll push two onto the stack, and then when we execute the plus method, plus is gonna pop those two values off the stack and then push the return value onto the stack. So if we were implementing this virtual machine, we can imagine how one might implement the get, get Ivar instruction. It would be pretty simple, just maybe a method like this where we say, hey, I'm gonna take the name, the name is gonna come from the instruction, it's a parameter from the instruction, and the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look up self. Like what is the value, what is the object that we're operating on? And in this case, self is gonna be stored on the in the current frame. It's the current thing that we're operating on. Then we're gonna say, hey, I wanna get the, the hash table of instance variables. Uh, and then all I need to do is I just need to look up that, that value by name from the hash table and then just push that value onto the stack. So it's pretty easy to imagine how we could go from the tree walking interpreter into the, into the virtual machine implementation. Now the problem with this implementation is that hashes are slow when compared to arrays. I don't want to like, hashes aren't that slow, but if you compare it to an array, yes, it's slow. Um, hashes use a lot of memory when compared to arrays, because we have to, we, the hash data structure uses a lot more room than an array would use. So could we use an array instead of a hash? And the answer is yes, we could do that, but let's imagine like how, how might we implement something like that. So here we have our simple class again, hello, with a couple instance variables on it. And when we, what we can do is we can say, all right, well, when we allocate this new instance of hello, that instance has to point at a class. So it's gonna point at the hello class. And what we can do is we can say, hey, class, um, do you have an index for this instance variable? So we'll go ahead up here, we'll say, hey, I wanna set the instance variable foo. Do you have an index for it? And at first the class is like, no, I don't have an index for it, I will make you one. So it inserts foo into this hash table with an index of zero. So we know that foo maps to the index zero. And then we go ahead and we set the value one at the zeroth index in the array that's stored on the instance. So our class is keeping a map of names to indexes, indices. 
So we'll do the same thing for bar. We'll set bar. We'll say, hey, do you have an index for bar? It doesn't, so it creates a new one. And then we store the value two in, the, in that uh, one element index. Uh, so when we do this a second time, so let's say we, we perform this on a second instance, we're still running the program, um, our new instance will just say, hey, I want to set foo and bar. Those already exist in that hash table, so we don't need to, like, we don't need to create new indices, it just uses those and sets those in the array. Now, you might be looking at this and thinking, well, you know, you said, oh, hey, we have a hash table, it uses memory, don't, like, what's the deal? We still have a hash table here. That is true, yes. But we have, we're able to use, amortize the cost of this hash table across multiple instances of hello. So we can say, well, now we're able, instead of having a hash table per instance, now we have one that's associated with the class, and all of these instances are able to take advantage of the fact that that is stored on the class instead of the instance. Now, going from this, I want to talk about object layout a little bit, uh, because this is going to be important when we talk about the JIT compiler. The objects are laid out, we'll say that objects are 40 bytes wide. Some objects are wider in the new version of Ruby 3.2, but we're gonna consider 40 byte objects. And uh, that allows us to set three instance variables inside the object itself. So we can store three instance variables in line in the object. So in this particular case, we're gonna store the values one and two inside that array. We'll treat the object itself as the array. Now, the other thing I want to point out before we get to talking about JIT compilation is that the place where we store instance variables is different depending on the type of object that we're dealing with. So on the left here, we just have a normal plain old Ruby object and we set instance variables on it. On the right, we have a subclass of array where we store instance variables. The, the storage location of those instance variables changes depending on the type. So we care about the type. Um, so let's revisit the instruction implementation. Now we have to take into account when we're looking up the instance variable, hey, we gotta look at a class. Like, give me the class for the self. So first off, we have to ask for the class, then we ask the class for the index, and then we're able to look up the instance variable based on the index. And remember, we have an if statement there to check whether we're looking it up on an object or versus some other thing. But unfortunately, you might notice, oh, geez, we're still doing a hash lookup here and you said hashes were slow, so we need to eliminate that, and this is where we get into inline caches, where we should be able to cache that hash lookup, and we can do it inside of what is called an inline cache. And these are simply cache objects that are stored in line with your bytecode. So we'll say here we're gonna add a new parameter inside of the bytecode, which is this magic cache object, right? There is the magic cache object, and what we'll do is we'll cache the index inside of that, that object. So we'll say, hey, uh, if we don't have an index cached already, please go look up the index and then store it inside of the cache. Uh, if we, then below here, we just use the cached index. So if there is one cached, we'll use it, otherwise we go look it up. What this means is that there's usually no hash lookups. The first time we execute it, yes, we have to do it, but subsequent times we don't have to do that hash lookup, so we're able to eliminate it. However, there's a problem with this. Uh, remember that our name to index mapping is per class, so when we create the hello class, we've mapped foo and bar to zero and one, and we have an instance there as well. But when we execute the foo method, we're gonna store the indices zero and one inside of the inline cache for that foo method to look up, look up the instance variable zero and one. Now the problem is like, what about this world class down here? World sets an instance variable. Uh, it is a world, world class class. <laughs> Sorry, I gotta chew up a few seconds for at least a pun, one pun. Um, <laughs> all right, so we have a world class class, world class here, it's, it inherits from hello, it sets an instance variable before it calls super, so you can imagine what the index table looks like on the world class. We've set hello, we've set oops first in the world class, but we've cached the values zero and one in the foo method, so what happens when we call the foo method? Well, we're gonna look up the wrong values, we're gonna look up the values for oops, and we're gonna look up the values for foo, rather than foo and bar, which is what we expected. So this is gonna raise an exception and blow up. So we can fix this problem, it's not a big deal. We just use a class as a cache key as well. We say, all right, uh, the class needs to match, we need to have an index, we also need to have an index set, and then we can finally use that. So our, our instruction is getting a little bit more complicated. Now we have another problem where, I, I keep throwing in problems here, let's say we have an empty, hello, empty world class down at the bottom. 
we have changed nothing. We just have a subclass. But the problem is here, now that class is part of this cache key, this loop down here at the bottom, it oscillates between those instances. It calls foo on hello, then foo on world. And we keep doing that over and over, but since class is the cache key, it means we can never hit. We always look up hello, then look up world, and we're always missing the cache there. Now I'm gonna throw in one more monkey wrench, and that is uh, how do we deal with undefined instance variables? We all know like you can access an undefined instance variable and it returns the value nil. Like how do we deal, how do we deal with that? So imagine we have this first case here uh, where we're calling hello with true. True sets all three instance variables. So we have one, two, and three stored in line in the object. So those are all, those all come from these instance variables, these sets here. But what about the second case uh, where we're calling it with false? Well, what happens is when we allocate a new object, we fill in all the memory with a magic value, and this magic value is Q on def. Uh, so this second instance will end up with a layout like this where we have one and then Q on def and then the value three because we didn't set that middle, we didn't set that middle instance variable there. So you can kind of imagine how the implementation of instance variable defined works. Should be easy to figure this out. We just say, well, okay, let's go look up the index of bar and then we go look up the value for bar and we see that that value is this magic one called Q on def. So we're able to tell whether or not an instance variable has been defined. We can do that. Uh, and then when we, when we actually return this, so we've, we've cached the values zero and one here. Now the issue is, again, similarly to the previous problems, well, we can't return Q on def. We have to return the value nil. Like Q on def's not a real value. We need to return that. So we, we can't just return one and then Q on def. So the where we handle that is we handle that inside of our, our implementation of the get IVAR instruction. And I know this code is getting smaller and that is on purpose. I'm making a point. That it's getting more and more complicated. We have to handle all of these cases. We have to check, was this thing Q on def? If it was, we gotta return null. Otherwise, we return, our, we return the value inside of the array. So we keep getting more and more complicated as we're adding these, like adding these special cases. So just to recap, the conditionals for reading an instance variable is the index set in the cache, do the classes match in the cache, is it a type object, uh, is the IV value equal to Q on def? And to drive home how, how complicated this actually is, I wanna take a look at JIT compilation. So the way the JIT works from a high level is that when we've executed a method enough times, the JIT will pause. It'll say, oh, okay, uh, we're gonna stop right here for a second and we're gonna iterate over each of the instructions from the virtual machine, and we're gonna generate corresponding machine code for each of those instructions. And then rather than letting the virtual machine execute the instructions, it jumps into the machine code and executes that machine code instead. So let's take a look at the machine code for reading an instance variable, and I'm gonna call out each part here. The first thing we have to do is we have to check, well, is this thing an object? So we, do, we have to emit the machine code for that. Then the next thing we have to do is say, well, does the class match whatever is in the cache? We have to check that as well. And then the next thing we have to do is say, well, okay, uh, is it an embedded object or an extended object? Like, is it, is it, are those three IVARs stored inside the object itself? We also have to check, well, is it Q on def as well? Like, if it's Q on def, we gotta return nil. And then finally, finally down at the bottom, those last two instructions are read the IVAR and push it onto the stack. So we have 93 bytes of machine code for just reading one instance variable. We can actually do much better, and that's where object shapes comes into play. And no, it's not these types of shapes. In fact, there's really only one shape. It is a tree data structure, <laughs> It is this shape. So rather than like just explaining it, just saying, oh, it's a tree data structure, we're gonna try building it so we can kind of see what it looks like. Uh, the tree data structure is built every time we add an instance variable, every time we write to something. Uh, let us move more quickly. Uh, so when we write the value foo, we, we start out at a root shape, we write the value foo, and that value creates a new edge in this tree. And we cache the values from this new node inside the inline cache. So here we say we're writing value foo, the outgoing edge foo did not exist, so we'll write a new node with the outgoing edge foo, and we'll cache that it came from the shape zero and it's going to shape one, and that we set the instance variable on the IV index zero. So we cache these three values. We do the same thing with bar, ah, oh, okay, yes, our cache key, our cache key is the shape that we came from. It is our originating shape. 
So then we, we also cache the destination shape as well as the IV index. So the next thing we do, we do exactly the same thing with bar, except now we're going from shape ID 1 to shape ID 2. And I know this isn't very tree-like, but it is a tree. It's just a linear, very linear tree, maybe a tree trunk. I don't know. <laughs> All right, so the second time we execute this, we don't actually have to consult the tree. We just take a look at those cache keys. We say, oh, you're, you're currently shape zero. Well, I know shape zero goes to shape one, and it sets the IV on, in index zero, so we have a cache hit here. We know we make that transition. We do the same thing for the second one, so we have a cache hit, cache hit there. So these shapes form a graph, and all of the objects in this graph start from, all objects allocated start from this root shape. So they start from the root and they grow from that graph. And shapes only change when we're doing writes. Also, the shape ID is the cache key. And importantly, that means that the class of the object is not the cache key. We don't care about the class. We only care about the instance variables that were set and the order in which they were set. So what's cool about this is that we're able to share caches between subclasses. So in this case here, before we couldn't get a cache hit in the subclass, but now we can because we don't care, we don't care about the types anymore. We only care about the IVs and the order they were set. So we get to share those caches. The other thing is that we're able to do cross-type memory amortization. So this, this, what I mean by that is that shape tree is shared between all instances. So we saw that like we had a we had a an IV index table for a superclass and a subclass. Well, here now we just have one shape tree for all classes. So we're able to amortize this across multiple multiple types. Uh, we also get cross-type cache hits, which I'm going to show here again. This is our problem before, where we had the hello class and the world class oscillating between the two. And we couldn't get cache hits here, but in the world of shapes, well, in fact, those two types have exactly the same shape, this shape. So we're able to get cache hits here where we couldn't before. And if we do a very simple micro benchmark on this, I know you can't read it, I'm going to just write it bigger. It is about 2.7 times faster, this particular benchmark. And this is all an impacted by being able to do cache hits where we couldn't do them before. Oh boy, 50 slides left, all right. so. <laughs> Memory usage improvements, classes store their names as instance variables. So if you do hello.name, that class.name, that's read as an instance variable. Uh, John Hawthorne was able to take, convert classes to use object shapes as well. Uh, he sent a patch to do this. And you can imagine, like, all classes have a different class, which is a meta class. So, of course, we had to duplicate all this information among all classes. But since the, the classes can, uh, can use shapes now, we know that all of these classes have the same shape and we're able to amortize that, that cost. And he found in his application, this is, I think this is GitHub, GitHub's application, they were able to save about 16 megabytes worth of memory just on this, this one change. So I think that's pretty, pretty great. Um, to cover two more things, we're going to cover two more things, then we're going to get back to the JIT implementation. Not all properties, I was very careful to say properties, I think I was, hopefully. Not all properties of an object are instance, instance variables. Freezing the frozen state of an object is also a property of an object, and we've encoded the frozen state of an object into, into the object as a, as a shape transition. So here's an example, this will get a little bit more tree-like. So we'll do hello here, which was our normal shape we saw before, we'll set foo, and we'll set bar, that's great, and then we're gonna call this other, go transitions, go. We're gonna set this other value here, so we'll have, we'll have a, we start off with shape two there on the first instance. We set another instance variable that goes to shape three, so that's great. Now our second, our second instance, we're gonna set those two, those two instance variables, that'll be a cache hit in the tree, and then we freeze it, and we just create a new, uh, a new transition off of the bar transition. We say, hey, we're gonna transition you to frozen now. Now when we call set, you can see here that we actually have a cache miss in this case. So we'll try to call set, and that's gonna raise an exception because you can't set an instance variable on a frozen object. So in this case, we're, we're using shape four, and we're trying, to, we're trying to set an instance variable there, but you can see that that will be a cache miss in this case. So what's really cool about that is we can say, well, before we always had to check whether or not an object was frozen before we could set, set the, uh, set the instance variable, but now we really only need to do this frozen status check 
when we do a cache miss. So we don't need to do that check at runtime anymore. Well, at not, we can do it on cache miss time. So frozen checks only occur on cache misses when we're using object shapes. And I have another benchmark here. We're benchmarking the IV write performance. Again, it's too small to read, but you can see that it is about 21% faster. So IV writes get faster. And this isn't taking into account JIT at all. This is just normal VM execution. So since we don't have to check, check frozen status anymore, we can set instance variables much faster. So let's talk about JIT performance now. Uh, to understand JIT performance a bit better, I want to talk about the layout of objects again. Now, the object layouts have, all objects in Ruby have two fields that are the same. It's the top two fields. There's a flags field and then a pointer to the class. Now, the rest of the, the, rest of the slots in the object change depending on the type of object that we're dealing with. So a T object will have store instance variables, an array will store array elements, et cetera, et cetera. So let's take a look at what the fields flag is. The fields flag is a 64-bit integer on 64-bit platforms. And this is kind of the layout of that bit field, which you can't read. This, those numbers are, they're not important. Read it in the slides later. Uh, the bottom five bits represent what type of object we're dealing with. So that maps to the object type. And then we have uh, seven more bits above it which are common to all objects. So these, these bottom 12 bits are common to all objects in the system. For example, one of these bits represents whether or not an object ID was seen. So we lazily generate object IDs and we have to keep track of which objects have, see, have had object ID called on them. So in this case, down here we have an object.new.objectID and an array.objectID. Either, both of those, when, a, when object ID is called, we'll flip this one bit right here. So we'll say, hey, okay, somebody called object ID on that. And it has the same meaning across all types. Now the upper bits, the meaning of those upper bits changes depending on the type of object that we're dealing with. In this case, we're dealing with, uh, with regular T object objects. And we have to keep a bit with regard to whether or not the object is extended. What that means is, well, you know, we can, we were all talking about three instance variables, but clearly we can store more than three instance variables, so how does that work? Uh, when we go to set the fourth instance variable, we say, well, we can't set that, like there's not room, so what we'll do is we'll allocate a buffer, and then we'll store all the instance variables in the buffer, and then we'll set a pointer that points at that buffer. And we have to be able to differentiate between objects that have a buffer and objects that don't, and that's what that particular bit is for, so we have to check that bit. So when the JIT compiler runs, oh, come on, three minutes? We got like 30 slides left, I'm so sorry, we're not, <laughs> okay. When the JIT compiler runs, we pause here and we have to check all of the, all of the uh, fields of the object. We have to check like, okay, what is the type of the object? Uh, is it embedded or extended? Is the IV queue on def? Uh, is the class correct? We have to check this at compile time and we have to essentially repeat those checks for runtime because we have to make sure that the object we see at runtime matches up with the thing that we saw at compile time. If it doesn't match, we need to exit the JIT. So the places where we have to do all those checks are, we have to check the header field, we have to check the object type, we have to check whether or not it was extended, we have to check is it the right class, we have to check if the value is QNDEF, so we have to check all over the place. And this is why the machine code for reading in one instance variable is so difficult, so long. So we can use shape IDs to eliminate those checks. We store the shape ID in the upper 32 bits of the 64-bit pointer. Uh, talk to me later about 32-bit machines if you care. We're not gonna get into it. Um, so we know from looking at the previous slides that we don't need to check class anymore. We don't care about that. Shape IDs are independent of class, so as long as we check the shape ID, we're good, so we're just gonna eliminate that check right away. We don't care about that. Uh, let's handle undefined variables. So we know that when we're building the shape tree for this object, we end up with one particular shape like this, so we end up with shape three when the instance variable is defined. So if we compile, if we JIT compile the foo method, we associate that compiled method along with shape ID three. Now, if we compile the second one, we know we end up with a separate shape. So we try to transition off of foo to set baz because we skipped bar. Again, we only care about the names of instance variables and the order. So we have a different shape here. So now the JIT compiler can say, well, I know I'm compiling for shape three. Inside of shape three, the instance variable bar exists. I know for sure it exists because I'm looking at shape three. 
Now, if it compiles this method for shape four, it's able to know, well, the instance variable bar, it does not exist, it is not set. I know it's not set in here because I'm looking at shape four, it's not in the tree. So we're able to use this shape ID as our cache key, so we can say, well, we don't care about checking whether or not an instance variable is QNDEF or not. Now, we can kind of do another trick here to get rid of, get rid of this uh, bit field check on uh, extended versus embedded. So the way we do that is we say, well, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new transition for everything that gets embedded. So we'll start out with an object like this. Maybe it only stores two instance variables. I wanted to fit this on a slide. So we store those two instance variables, and then we say, well, we can't store any more, so we need to allocate an external buffer. What we're gonna do is we're gonna allocate, we're gonna create a magic like extended shape. So we'll create an extended shape here. We'll insert the extended shape, allocate an external buffer, store the instance variables in the external buffer, and then finally create our, create our shape for that last, that last instance variable. So we end up with shape four. Now if we compare this to something that's completely embedded, we'll go along and say, all right, we're gonna hit foo, we're gonna hit bar, and then we don't need to extend this, so we create a new shape off of bar for that particular, that particular edge baz. So we end up with a different shape depending on whether or not an object has been embedded or extended. So we have shape five down here at the bottom. Now the JIT compiler can differentiate between these two types of objects. So we know that, we know that in this case shape five is associated with an object that's not extended and shape four is associated with an extended object. Which means we don't really need to do this check anymore, we just check the shape ID. So we have one more thing to, to get to tackle which is object types. And what we do here is we just say well okay, oh, I'm over, all right, fine. We'll be done with this shortly, I'm sorry. So what we'll do here is we'll say, well, on, on allocation time, okay, we have, we have an issue here. Like, let's say we say hello, we fire off hello, hello is allocated, shape three. We do the same thing on array. Remember, we only care about instance variable names and the way in which they're ordered. So these two would end up with the same shape ID, which is a problem because we know that different types store instance variables differently. So the way we deal with this is fairly easy. We just say, okay, well, when we allocate a new object type versus an array, we say, all right, uh, we're gonna start at the root shape, but then we're gonna immediately transition to a special shape type called uh, T object. So anytime we allocate a, Ruby a regular Ruby object, we'll immediately do a transition, and then we'll base all of our shapes off of that. So we go through there like this, and we end up with shape ID four right there. For arrays, we don't do that immediate transition, so we do all of our transitions based off of the root shape, and we end up with a different shape ID depending on the type of object that we're dealing with, which means we're able to eliminate this check too. All we need to do is check the shape ID in the JIT. So the only thing that's required is a, is a shape ID check. And this is able to reduce our JIT compiled code down to, from the left to what we have on the right here. All we have to do in the stuff on the right is say, well, let's make sure it's the right shape ID. If it's the right shape ID, then we're just gonna read the instance variable and push that onto the stack. So benchmark comparison here, we're doing, we're measuring the cost of fetching an instance variable inside of the JIT. This time we're running it with the JIT compiler. Uh, this particular benchmark, we're comparing YJIT before object shapes versus YJIT after, and we're about 45% faster when we, use, when we use the object shapes technique. And I think 45% faster, it's not like impressive enough, I think. So if we compare uh, the JIT compiler to regular Ruby, it's 3.7 times faster before shapes. After shapes, it's now 5.4 times faster to read an instance variable. So in the future, I'd like to use this technique possibly for reducing the size of our objects to 32 bytes. Uh, TLDR of this presentation is that object shapes lead us to fewer checks and faster code. I don't have time for questions, thank you.